Hi, my name is Rebecca. I am a scientist who studies soil at the University of Arizona, and I love my job. I am here today to teach you about why soil is not dirt, and why dirt is actually a disrespectful four-letter word. I am also here to take you on a scientific journey into the deserts and mountains of southern Arizona. If you had told me when I was a kid that I would be waking up at 5 a.m. to study soil, I would have been confused. Why would anyone want to study dirt? Why is that important? And why so early in the morning? In college, I developed an appreciation for soil and outdoor science that carried me into a soils graduate program where I learned that soils are essential to plants, animals, and human beings. I also began to wonder why soil, the foundation of life, was dismissed as dirt by so many people. Since then, I learned that 5 a.m. outings are sometimes required to beat the summer heat, and that a desert sunrise is one of the most fantastic things that you will ever experience. No matter where you are or what you do, going on a trip outdoors is always full of adventure. Let's begin ours now through the eyes of a soil scientist. When I chose to pursue a biology degree in college, I made the decision based on my own personal interests. I knew that I enjoyed science classes, that I was engaged during laboratory exercises, and that I admired my biology and chemistry teachers in school. I also knew that I did not want to wear a business suit to work every day, and that I loved the outdoors. Sometimes, the sound of my boots crunching on the trail, the majestic call of a hawk flying overhead, or the murmuring of a nearby stream will still trigger disbelief. I actually get paid to do this. How lucky am I? And while I do not spend all of my time working outdoors, the time I do spend there enriches my view of the natural world and helps me understand the environments where I work. I am currently headed to my first dryland site in the Sonoran Desert. Drylands, which include air deserts, are regions of the world known for low rainfall and water scarcity that are occupied by about one third of the global population. Drylands encompass more than 40% of the land on Earth and are especially susceptible to climate change given the water-limited nature of the ecosystems. The desert in Arizona is not the barren, desolate place that you may expect. My first field site receives an average of 17 and a half inches or 45 centimeters of rain a year. My site is located at an elevation of 3,600 feet or just under 1,100 meters. The average temperature is around 65 degrees Fahrenheit or 18 degrees Celsius, which incorporates the coldest days of winter and the hottest days of summer. Even in such a dry, warm environment, the Sonoran Desert is full of life. There are plants, birds, insects, mammals, reptiles, and even a multitude of microorganisms in the soil. Soils are the living, breathing fabric separating our atmosphere from the Earth's crust. As you know, soils support our agriculture and food production. What you may not realize is that soils are also critical for stabilizing the foundations of buildings, like our homes and businesses, and for filtering the groundwater that we drink. Soils are also the focus of much climate research worldwide, even in the deserts of the United States. As soil scientists, we love our soils. We love studying how soils change across landscapes, under different types of plants, and in different climates. But why? When considering global climate change, you may think about oil, coal, and natural gas. These fossil fuels formed from the remains of prehistoric plants and animals that were buried under many layers of mud, sand, and rock. Those buried plants and animals were then transformed by heat and pressure over millions of years. Humans burn these fuels to power our cars and factories, which releases greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, into our atmosphere. Since these greenhouse gases can warm our Earth, scientists are interested in how carbon dioxide and other forms of carbon are stored and moved across our oceans, land, and atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is moved from the atmosphere to plants through photosynthesis. This is how plants convert sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide into energy, or the food needed for plant growth. Carbon is the building block of life. A plant uses carbon-based energy to construct its cells and structure. And when the plant dies or is burned in a fire, the carbon building blocks remain, usually just in a different molecular form. Soils are a critical component to this global balance because as a whole, soils store two times as much carbon as live plants, 
and three times as much carbon as the atmosphere. Let's get back to our soils here in Arizona. Where is the carbon in the soil? Can you see it? Soil carbon is the decomposing leaves at the soil surface, dead and decaying plant roots within the soil, and the charcoal remaining behind after a wildfire. Soil carbon can even bind to individual particles of soil that cannot be seen with just your eyes. Soil is unique. Soil has its own colors, its own structure, and its own boundaries. As a soil scientist, I explore the properties of the soil in the field and in the laboratory. I investigate changes in how the soil looks, how the soil feels, and how the soil responds to various tests to identify the different layers of soil that you can see here. Soil scientists call these layers horizons. I carefully record my observations and collect samples from each horizon to take back to the laboratory to analyze in more detail. What is our desert soil telling us? You can see that the desert soil has little to no plant material on the surface. You also do not notice a large number of roots in the soil. If you imagine a color scale from white to black, you can also see that the soil is light or pale in color. Despite its beauty, our observations are showing us that this desert soil does not contain a lot of carbon, which reflects the dry, hot climate that the soils have formed in. The transition from the desert to mountain landscape is met with a unique mixture of desert grasslands and oak woodlands. Here, my second field site is located at an elevation of 4,700 feet or 1,400 meters, where there is more rainfall and slightly cooler temperatures. As we move up into the mountains, there is more rain, which leads to more plant growth and more leaves and roots in the soil. The desert grassland and oak woodland soils are much different than the desert soils, even though there is only about 1,000 feet of elevation gain. What changes will occur in the soil? You can see that there are more dead leaves and plant material on top of the soil. The dead plant material breaks down and is slowly incorporated into the soil over time giving the soils a darker color, especially towards the surface. As you go deeper into the soil, you can see that the soil becomes lighter, matching the properties of the parent rock below. What does this mean? The surface soils of this site are storing more carbon than the desert soils. Climate and plant type also appear to be important factors. Here, there was more carbon stored in grassland and woodland soils with greater rainfall and slightly cooler temperatures. Let's continue our journey to figure out what other factors impact soil carbon. The Santa Catalina Mountains are one of many Sky Island ranges in the western United States. Sky Island is a term used to describe mountains that rise from the desert valleys in the same way that oceanic islands rise from the sea. The Sky Islands connect large expanses of desert to forested mountain ecosystems across 70,000 square miles of the southwest providing field laboratories for the study of soils and soil carbon across different climates and plant types. I have a story to share with you as we drive into the forests of Arizona. When I was 18, my hometown was partially destroyed by a wildfire. Hundreds of homes burned. Thousands of acres of forest were damaged. After the fire was put out, my family was one of the first to pass the roadside barricades. We drove by smoldering homes, melted call boxes, singed road signs, and a burnt minivan with the words, please tow to safety, etched into the windshield. Despite the destruction of man-made materials, I was fixated by the environment around me. The canyons, hideouts, and hiking trails that I relish as a child were reduced to charred tree trunks and ash. The fragility of the environment became apparent to me, as did the interconnections between mankind and the natural world. When you hear about a wildfire, you may imagine suffocating smoke, displaced wildlife, and hills of burning forest with glowing flames licking towards the sky. What you may not picture is the environment after the fire is contained and the billowing smoke cleared. If you were to walk through a forest immediately after a fire, what would you see? Matchstick trees? Smoldering embers? Charred plants? What about the soil? Let's take a moment to explore the soils at my third field site that was disturbed by fire in the last decade. My pine forest site averages a temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius and receives an average of 91 centimeters or 36 inches of rain and snow a year. The site receives twice as much precipitation as my desert site and lies at an elevation of 7,300 feet or 2,200 meters above sea level. 
As I dig into this pine soil, one of the first things you may notice is the persistence of the black charcoal in the soil surface. A dense mat of recent dead plant material mixed with charcoal is apparent as I continue to dig. You can even see that this layer forms a distinct soil horizon that becomes more obvious as I finish preparing our soil pit for study. At my previous sites, you learned that darker colors in the surface meant that a soil contained more carbon in the form of decomposing plant material. How does the charcoal fit into this? Charcoal is another type of soil carbon. However, scientists have to be aware that decaying plant material and charcoal are different types of soil carbon that can behave quite differently in the soil. My work has focused on how long each type of carbon remains in the soil over time. I have found that the dead plant material in the form of decaying leaves can remain in the soil for decades before being broken down by microorganisms. However, charcoal can be more stable depending on the soil environment and can persist for hundreds or even thousands of years, especially if the charcoal is buried and preserved in the soil over time. For me, it is fascinating to study soil carbon. I can look at this beautiful charcoal-rich soil horizon from a fire 10 years ago and think, wow! Some of this carbon may still be here in the same soil for another researcher to explore hundreds of years in the future. Amazing! What will we discover next? If you think back to the global carbon cycle, carbon that persists in the environment is of great importance to researchers and to every human on Earth. We need to be aware of soil carbon that can persevere this long in the environment, especially as scientists and policymakers discuss possible strategies for regulating carbon storage and climate change on a global scale. Forests are important to humans for shelter, lumber, firewood, clean water, and medicine. Forests provide habitat for countless species from mammals to microorganisms. Forests and its associated soils filter and store water by removing pollutants, slowing the flow of rainwater, preventing flooding, and replenishing groundwater supplies. All of these things are required for human survival. Forests also store large amounts of carbon in the plants and soil, an important consideration for global carbon cycling. As a kid, my summers were spent outside among pine trees, oak trees, and manzanita. My world consisted of a secret fort and a rickety old tree house. There was a muddy pond that I just had to swim in once or twice, which led to an impressive number of bug bites. At the end of the day, the more covered I was in dust, leaves, and mud, the more exhilarated I felt. Not much has changed. I am drawn to the outdoors, and I am the first to admit that I feel most at home in the forest. Here is the fourth and final site of my study. The mixed conifer field area is located at 7,900 feet or 2,400 meters above sea level which is more than twice the elevation of my desert site. My sites here receive an average of 95 centimeters or 37 inches of rain and snow a year with an average temperature of 48 degrees Fahrenheit or 9 degrees Celsius. The wet, cool mixed conifer forest is a mixture of ideal conditions for plant growth and amazing soil formation. As you examine the mixed conifer soils and compare soil color, depth, and other properties to my previous sites, you can start to see just how important our high elevation soils are. Why is that? First, you can see that the mixed conifer soils are deeper than you saw at the other sites, reflecting a greater amount of soil being formed from the bedrock. Greater rainfall, cooler temperatures, and more plant material in the soil are likely contributing to this difference in soil depth. Second, my research has also shown that the mixed conifer soils contain more soil carbon, as you might guess based on the amount of dead plant material on the landscape surface and the dark soil colors that you see, especially in the surface soils. Based on soil samples that I collected at this site, I also found that the mixed conifer soils store more soil carbon for longer periods of time than the desert and pine soils you saw earlier. What does this tell you? Our high elevation forests are important for long-term carbon storage. Unfortunately, the mixed conifer forests in water-limited areas such as the southwestern U.S. are especially vulnerable to drought and shifting climates. Climate scientists are predicting an upward elevation shift of desert ecosystems and a decrease in the area that supports high elevation forests. Shifting plant communities will likely change soil carbon storage mechanisms, but how? Globally, how will our soils adapt to these environmental changes? As scientists, we are still seeking answers to climate change questions. Today, 
you took an adventure with me across my research sites to explore how soils change across the deserts and mountains of Arizona. At my sites, you saw firsthand that soil science is a complex field of study because soils are influenced by many factors, including fire, plants, rain, snow, and even the rock the soils form on. Thank you for joining me. Now I have a favor to ask of you. The next time you are out on a walk or drive, please take a moment to think about the living, evolving soil beneath you. The soil that enables the plants and animals around you to thrive. The soil that stabilizes your home. The soil that filters your water. The soil that grows your food. The soil that makes your very life possible. And then, maybe then, you will realize why soil, our common yet precious resource, has nothing to do with dirt.